Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar Tops. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Ho Jin Park, a tobacco control researcher and job market candidate from the Department of Economics at the University of Kansas. Tops is being organized by Catherine McLean at Temple University, Mike Pasco at Georgia State University, Chi Xiang at the Ohio State University, and Justin White at the University of California, San Francisco. The seminar will be one hour with questions asked by the moderator and discussion. The audience may post questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments meeting seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. Your comments are very much appreciated. The presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Shi Shang at the Ohio State University to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Today, we continue our fall 2021 season with a traditional paper presentation by Dr. Justin White, an associate professor of health economics in the School of Medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, UCSF. With joint appointments in Philip R. Lee Institute for Health Policy Studies and the Department of Epidemiology and Bell Statistics. His talk is titled, Estimating Biases in Smoking Cessation, Evidence from a Field Experiment. Dr. White studies how monetary and social incentives can be used to promote healthy behavior, informed uh, by research from the field of behavioral economics. Much of his work focuses on smoking cessation, both in the US and in low and middle income countries. Uh, his work draws on a variety of methodological approaches, including randomized interventional trials and quasi-experimental econometric techniques applied to large data sets. Recent and ongoing projects involve evaluations of excess taxes on cigarettes and sugar sweetened beverages, tobacco minimum price ordinance, and gamification in smoking cessation smartphone app. Our discussion today is Dr. Christopher Carpenter of Vanderbilt University. Dr. White will be presenting his research in two segments. We will have a pause after each segment to allow for questions. Dr. White, thank you for presenting for us today. Great, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, this is an excellent uh, excuse to, to dig up this paper. It's one that has, um, I think, been a casualty of COVID. So um, I'm excited to um, use this as an excuse to resuscitate it. And um, so I'm going to be talking about, it's a paper um, uh, sort of straight out of uh, behavioral economics and experimental economics. And as you'll see, it's a little bit un, uh, atypical for TOPS presentations, since our focus here will be a bit about specific um, estimating behavioral parameters rather than looking at specific policies or interventions. This is joint work with Frank Chalupka at the University of Illinois Chicago and Matt Levy um, at uh, the London School of Economics. So I forgot to share slides, here we are. Um, okay. So, uh, do, 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 do. one second. Okay, so um, funding for the study was from the National Institute on uh, Drug Abuse, NIDA, and we're really grateful for their support of this study. Um, this content is not, uh, does not represent their views, it is solely our responsibility. Uh, I have no other competing interests to, to disclose. Uh, my co-authors and I have never received funding from the tobacco and nicotine industries. This experiment was uh, pre-registered in the AEA RCT registry, and so that's for social science studies, and it was approved by the IRB at the University of Illinois Chicago. So I'm gonna uh, start with an introduction and uh, a bit on the experimental design. Justin, uh, sorry I, for interrupting. I don't think your slides are advancing, so. Okay, I appreciate you letting me know. Let me try to see if I can uh, do this again. Okay. Okay. Uh, let me stop sharing and I, I will start sharing again. Okay. 
can you see my slides advancing or? Uh, yeah, I, we're seeing outline. Okay. Uh, yeah. And do you see now disclosures? Uh, not really. Not really. No. Okay. I'm, I'm just going to stretch it to uh, not be quite full screen. Okay. Now we see disclosures. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let me. Uh, okay. Uh, something with the full screen uh, gets screwy occasionally. Okay, so um, like I said, th this um, you, you can see my disclosures here that I just covered. Um, so I I'll cover the introdu introduction and motivation for this study, um, a bit on the experimental design, and then I'll go through the experimental results, um, which uh, economists would call the reduced form results, which are essentially the results that come directly from the experiment without overlaying our particular um, behavioral model. And then I'll go through the structural estimation results. And that is where we do overlay our particular model of behavior. Um, because this is an interdisciplinary audience, I'm really not going to focus a lot on uh, the, the structural model, um, but we, we do cover it in depth in the paper. And uh, so our, our research questions here are, to what extent do individuals make biased decisions about smoking cessation? And here we're using a particular uh, notion of biases uh, to have to do with the decisions or beliefs that um, individuals hold that might deviate from uh, what a rational agent might uh, do or believe. And as it relates to smoking, a, a lot of this is going to have to do specifically with addiction. And so we, well, we can think about this as sort of like the behavioral manifestations of addiction. Uh, and then uh, we are focused specifically on the biases that have been suggested in the behavioral economics literature. There are many other um, you know, uh, biases outside of behavioral economics. Uh, that have been identified, but we're going to focus on the ones in behavioral economics because those are ones where there's a particular mathematical equation that goes with the biases that we can then um, incorporate into our structural model later. And then we're, the second question is, what do these biases imply for the welfare um, or uh, pleasure of individuals who smoke? And so uh, we're going to try to determine the value of the loss in welfare due to biased smoking decisions to the extent that we find them. And we're going to present those in terms of utility um, as well as in terms of money. So why would we want to know this? Um, there are a few different reasons. So the first is as an input into a regulatory impact analysis, or RIA, or cost benefit analysis of tobacco policies. In the US, federal agencies, including the FDA, are required to assess the costs and benefits of major regulatory actions and to select the one that has the, the greatest net benefit. And uh, so deciding sort of what, what the um, costs and benefits are are very important for uh, regulatory uh, decisions. And uh, I, I would argue that um, those RIAs should consider the costs of any biases that individuals hold. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, in, in addition, sort of just more generally thinking about cost benefit analyses um, of tobacco policies, I, I think that it would be uh, uh, ideal to try to incorporate um, the, the cost of any biases that um, are identified. Second, so we might, uh, why would we want to know about biases and welfare would be to try to improve our understanding of behavior and smoking behavior in particular. Behavioral economics um, you know, is still a relatively nascent field. And I think there's not a lot of good empirical evidence about what the extent of these biases are, um, especially in real world situations. And so we think that we are uh, can contribute to that discussion. And uh, a lot of the literature on uh, uh, behavioral biases as they apply to smoking um, does not re rely on real world evidence either. And so I, I think we, we are trying to contribute there. Third, um, in terms of thinking about what policies and interventions are, are most appropriate, 
Um, well, that can be informed by uh, what we find out about people's behavior and the extent to which they have behavioral biases. Um, you know, policy proposals are going to depend on what our theory of smoking behavior are. So, for example, if we're thinking about tobacco taxation, you know, what do we think the price elasticity is going to be? Well, that, that depends on how you uh, model uh, underlying behavior. If you're using, for example, a rational choice model or rational addiction model or so, some behavioral model. And here, um, what we're going to advocate is for moving away from a rational addiction model, which is one that has been commonly used in economics. Um, and it, it really focuses on the, um, the importance of smoking externalities for um, weighing costs and benefits. And we're going to, to try to examine internalities, uh, as they've been called, which are the costs that smokers might impose on themselves. And we'll talk about those uh, in, in more depth later. Okay, so estimating the costs of regulations that affect uh, addictive goods. So regulations can impose costs on individuals. Um, you know, uh, so for most goods, uh, when there's a regulation, it's going to lead people to the, the, the goal is oftentimes to get people to change behavior. And so what you would want to do is weigh the benefits of that behavior change versus versus whatever costs that's in, imposed on uh the, the individuals and that those costs are known as the lost consumer surplus. So, for example, you know, let's say we require people to wear seatbelts. Well, maybe there's some discomfort that comes with wearing seatbelts. And so, you know, you would want to factor in whatever lost um, uh, utility or pleasure that comes from uh, that, that, that discomfort. It gets a little bit thornier, though, when we think about addictive goods like smoking. And so here we have to think about whether we're going to offset the health benefits from tobacco regulations with the lost pleasure to smokers who quit. And so, you know, the, the goal of uh, tobacco control regulations is to get people to, uh, to, to quit smoking or, or uh, quit tobacco use. And so, the, you know, are those individuals losing uh, some sort of utility or uh, well, welfare from uh, the behavior change? And uh, how should we incorporate that into the, the, these cost benefit calculations? And there has been, you know, for the last uh, several years, sort of an ongoing debate around what the best way would be to account for addiction and possible internalities in those calculations. The idea that, um, you know, people might be uh, better off by, uh, you know, they might be helping themselves by, uh, by changing behavior in response to the regulation. And um, there, there have been, you know, a number of attempts at trying to estimate what the um, offset of lost pleasure should be, um, and uh, those estimates have really varied widely. So, you know, from 10 to 99 percent of the health benefits of quitting. So, in other words, you know, maybe this loss uh, utility to, to smokers, it could be a small fraction of the health benefits of quitting if it's only 10 percent versus, you know, the entire health benefits being offset by this lost consumer surplus. Okay, so there have been a number of ways that have been uh, uh, proposed for how you might estimate these net benefits of regulations. And I'm just gonna quickly sort of walk through what those uh, major approaches are because uh, we, we take you know, a very particular approach, which is actually a little bit different from what's been most common in the literature. So uh, one way to do, to try to figure out what these net benefits are, where net benefits is you know, benefits minus costs, um, of the regulation. So you could think about doing a willingness to pay methodology where, so for example, you know, you think about a, a, a smoking cessation product like Chantix, and you can see how much people are willing to pay for that, um, that product. And so if they're willing to pay for it, then we can assume that the benefits exceed the costs of Chantix. And so, um, you know, we can come up with some sort of um, net benefit calculation that way. Um, of course, if people, the, in their decisions about how much they're willing to pay, those valuations of Chantix could also be biased. And, you know, in the case of Chantix, it gets complicated because of, um, you know, insurance coverage, et cetera. But um, in principle, you can, you can uh, do some sort of willingness to pay methodology. Um, another approach might be to actually directly try to measure um, individuals' well-being. Um, so, you know, you could think about ecological momentary assessments or some other way to try to actually measure um, people's, you know, happiness and, and how they respond to, to different regulations or, um, you know, uh, uh, within a research environment, sort of trying to measure, simulate what a, a policy would be. 
Um, you know, that there's a, a bit of a challenge there that it's hard to map actually these this subjective well-being scales onto utility um, because it, it really depends a little bit on a, a lot on, on how the measurement takes place. Um, the most common way that this has been done is what's called the rational benchmark approach. So the idea here is that you define some rational group of smokers. So, for example, people who have a lot of education or people who, according to um, a Thagerstrom test of nicotine dependence are, are shown to be less addicted. And we're going to assume that those people are quote unquote rational. And so then we can compare those rational smokers and how they, they behave versus the behavior of uh, other, other groups of smokers. So for example, uh, non-college educated or highly addicted smokers. And then you can sort of infer what the net benefits of regulations might be by comparing those two groups. Okay. So there's been a lot of evidence um, that uh, using the rational benchmark uh, approach, and, and I think that's really been helpful for advancing the field. We are going to take what's called a structural approach. And so uh, what this does is it's going to start with a very specific behavioral model. And I'll talk about that, um, what that is later, and then uh, choosing values of uh, the, trying, trying to identify what those deep structural behavioral parameters are. So, for example, for these behavioral biases, um, and uh, try to input that into our model to come up with calculations of, of welfare. So this is really challenging because you know there are a lot of assumptions that have to go into this structural model, um, it, you know, and oftentimes it, it's not clear exactly what the right assumptions are. Uh, and typically, what's been done is that uh, this has been based on calibration exercises, where, for example, um, uh, researchers would assume let's say that somebody has this bias of this extent, what does that imply for welfare? And you know that, that's a, a useful exercise, but it doesn't tell us exactly what those parameters should be and whether that assum assumed bias, uh, extent of bias it, it is accurate. Okay, so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna run a randomized field experiment that's gonna try to obtain the structural estimates for three key biases that have been identified in behavioral, the behavioral economics literature that might afflict smokers. Present bias preferences, naive beliefs regarding present bias, projection bias beliefs over future abstinence. And I'll explain each of these in turn in a moment. And all three of these uh, really depart from rationality and rational choice and the rational addiction model. And what we would argue is an advantage of our approach is that we're going to use this randomized experiment uh, to try to measure these um, parameters, these biases. And that's going to minimize the need that we're going to have to make um, arbitrary assumptions when we're estimating our structural model. So we still are going to have to make some assumptions, but uh, hopefully there are going to be fewer of those than we otherwise would need to make. Uh, okay, so going through each of these three biases, the first one is called present bias preferences, and this is the one that I think has received the most attention in the literature, and I, I think colloquially we can think of this as imperfect self-control. The idea as it applies to smoking might be that uh, people, uh, smokers, would overweight the immediate pleasure from satisfying a craving or avoiding withdrawal symptoms at the expense of future health and financial benefits. This is all about um, the way people weigh uh, consequences now versus the future. So the, you know, the immediate discomfort from uh, trying to quit versus the long-term benefits. It's all about that time trade-off. And this idea of present bias is very closely associated with um, delayed discounting that has been uh, studied uh, extensively in, in psychology. So the way that behavioral economists have modeled present bias is by uh, breaking up utility, so people's you know, uh, welfare function. Um, so you have uh, you basically what, what's your utility now versus what's your utility in the future. And everything that hits in the future, we're going to discount it by some amount beta. So the idea is that like we care less about what happens in the future, we really care about what happens now. And so if beta equals one, in other words, we're not going to discount future utility at all, then we would say that people are time consistent and they're not present biased. If beta is less than one, meaning that we are going to discount uh, the future, then 
we're, we're going to discount by a factor of whatever beta is, that means people are going to be time inconsistent or present biased. And there's a lot of suggestive evidence that points to present bias, both in the context of, uh, of smoking as well as uh, other behaviors. Um, and so some of the key evidence here has been uh, the use of pre-commitment. So the idea is that people, for example, would be willing to um, say sign a contract that's going to commit them to, to quitting. Um, as well as there, there's been a number of studies that have been that have tried to directly measure people's time preferences or um, discount rates. And those those do tend to um, be consistent with uh, us with the idea that people might be present biased. Okay, the second bias that we're going to be talking about is naive beliefs about present bias. So this is inherent. This is very, very closely associated with the first bias. But instead of whether people actually have self control problems is what do people believe about their self control problems, and that individuals might differ in how aware they are of their future self control. So if, if people are sophisticated about their um, self control problems or their degree of self control, then uh, they're, they're fully self aware and they're able to, you know, make uh, good decisions about um, potential uh, issues with self-control. So for example, somebody might have, an, they might recognize that they have issues with, um, uh, you know, uh, how much they're, they're smoking and they're smoking more than they want to. But if they're sophisticated, they might look for ways to sort of ration the amount that they're smoking. You know, there's been some studies that, for example, uh, people might try to buy packs of cigarettes instead of cartons in order to prevent splurging. That, that's one example where sophisticates would, would be responding to their um, the fact that they're aware that they might have self-control problems. Whereas naives, people who are naive about their um, present bias or self-control, they don't recognize that, they, they recognize that they have self-control problems oftentimes, but they underestimate the extent to which they do. And it's gonna be especially when people are somewhat naive about um, their self-control that they're gonna to fail to correct the problem because they don't recognize that they have it. And so, for example, people might delay a quit attempt today because they might expect, you know, they, they recognize, oh, you know, today I really wanna smoke and I, I don't wanna deal with the discomfort uh, of um, withdrawal symptoms, but, you know, I think I'm gonna do it tomorrow. And then tomorrow comes around and then they push it off to the day after, et cetera. And so that, that uh, delay is, is sort of, very characteristic of um, naive behavior. So uh, there's a, there is a bunch of uh, evidence that's, that's suggestive of naivete as well. Um, there's uh, you know, a lot of survey of evidence that people, have, uh, smokers have widespread regret about having started smoking. Um, there's also an indication that people have very high relapse rates, uh, which uh, is also indicative uh, of this problem. And uh, in terms of how this gets modeled is that you can think of um, beta tilde being a belief about what your beta is. So the tilde is meant to, rec um, uh, to, to note that uh, it's be beliefs uh, about um, future self-control. And uh, in the case of, of this model, if people are naive, then beta tilde is going to be less than beta. Um, if people are sophisticated, then beta tilde is, if you're fully sophisticated, then your beta tilde is going to equal your beta. You recognize, you're fully aware of what your beta is. Okay, the third um, bias that we're going to be talking about is projection bias beliefs. This is also about beliefs. So whereas present bias was about preferences, um, naivete was about beliefs, projection bias is also about beliefs. And this is the idea that people are going to project how you feel now onto how you think you're going to feel in the future when you're in a different visceral state. And so there are two states, uh, state changes that are really important for smoking. So the first one is about short-term fluctuations. So this could be momentary that people, you know, maybe you're in a craving state now, but then you, uh, you smoke a cigarette, you're no longer feeling uh, the, the, the same degree of craving. So that, that's very short term. And when you're in a low craving state, you might fail to anticipate how you're going to feel when you're in a high craving state. So for example, you might overestimate what your future willingness would be to abstain when you're not craving. Whereas then when you are, when, when you are really in a high craving state, all of a sudden you're no longer willing to, to sort of deal with that discomfort. Um, and, and so uh, again, there's this sort of gap between what um, what your beliefs are about how you'll behave when you're when you're not craving versus when you are. The second uh, flavor uh, for for smoking is that there's this longer term transition from being addicted 
to not addicted. That's the second state change that we're going to think about. And so in an addicted state, um, you might fail pr to predict how your preferences are going to change once you are no longer addicted. So in particular, when you are addicted, you might underestimate what those benefits would be to quitting um, because maybe, you, you know, you're magnifying the extent to which there might be that um, uh, discomfort of having to go through um, withdrawal in, in cravings. Um, and that might underestimate the, your, um, lead you to underestimate your subsequent willingness to abstain from smoking. You might not even try to, to, to quit because of uh, because you fail to appreciate sort of um, what your uh, the benefits of quitting might be. And this is actually what we're gonna focus on. So uh, our experiment is designed to really get at um, this number two, the, this uh, state change from people being addicted to not addicted. And so we're gonna embed in, in our experiment, a smoking cessation intervention that's gonna induce a, a change in addiction state. Okay, so to preview our findings, so we find that smokers substantially overestimate their future abstinence. 100% of our sample is present biased, and we find that there's an average beta of 0.67. So again, that's discounting future utility um, relative to now um, by a, a factor of 0.67. Um, subjects are partially aware of their present bias, and we refer to it in the paper as being with, um, within a partially sophisticated range. So people actually are, are, are somewhat self-aware, but there's still um, a, a gap between, they're, they're not fully aware of, of their present bias. And um, we, we do also look at heterogeneity in the biases, and I'm not really going to have a chance to go into that, but um, we do find some uh, interesting patterns there. Um, our abstinence intervention does increase the likelihood of future abstinence. And so that means that we are um, pushing people out of their addicted state. Um, but on average, even though this intervention is going to increase um, abstinence, before, before the intervention, the subjects don't anticipate that the treatment is going to work. So in other words, they are highly projection biased about this intervention and about the benefits of, of quitting. After the fact, we find that subjects actually believe that the intervention made them slightly worse off. So people don't, even though the intervention makes them, uh, uh, improves their utility, they don't actually appreciate the fact that it did after the fact, which is really not consistent with um, simple projection bias. Um, and so when we do our welfare calculations, we find that continuing to smoke is in some sense efficient um, if people are present biased and when they're addicted. Um, however, if after we account for the fact that they're present bias and uh, subject to pro projection bias, we find that um, smoking actually reduces welfare by $414 per week um, for, for individuals in our sample. Um, so this is a very, uh, a fairly substantial private welfare loss that um, individuals are suffering as a result of um, uh, smoking. Okay, so we see our contributions as uh, fourfold here. So one is uh, that we have we introduced this new lottery-based approach that I'll talk about for how we can measure uh, smoking status remotely in a way that incentivizes accurate reporting, which economists call being incentive compatible. Um, we're going to experimentally identify estimates of biases um, in, uh, based on a willingness to pay methodology. Uh, we're going to use uh, field evidence as opposed to lab evidence, and we're going to have the, we're going to capture multiple biases here. Okay, so getting to our the actual experiment, this is individual level field experiment over three months or twelve weeks. It's going to be about four hundred cigarette smokers from sixteen large U.S. metro areas. We recruited them online through um, an online panel. Um, our eligibility criteria was these were adults who had to smoke at least twenty of the. Um, the prior 30 days, they had to have access to a smartphone uh, or tablet camera. They had to agree to in-person study visits from, uh, for, from uh, study personnel, and they had to verify themselves as being a smoker using a saliva coating test. And I'll talk about how we did that. We do not screen on quit expectations. So, you know, something like 40% of our sample did not want to quit smoking within the next year. So we, we do think that these re results will apply sort of fairly broadly to um, a, a broad group of, of smokers. You can see here, these are the 16 metro areas um, that we targeted. Um, they're all lar large um, metro areas. Um, 
it's important to recognize that there are actually multiple randomizations going on in the study. It's very easy to get lost in the fact that um, we have what's called the treated group, but there are actually three important um, inner uh, randomizations that are going on. So the first is that um, we are going to ask people to make predictions and valuations about um, future abstinence incentives. So in other words, what if we offer you a certain amount of, uh, of money to quit in the future, what do you predict your likelihood would be to quit smoking? And how valuable would those incentives be to you? And so we do uh, three sessions at baseline and a month one and a month two. And we're going to randomize the incentive amount from 10 to 400 hours. And we're going to randomize the week in which that occurs. Um, we're also going to actually offer the subsequently offer real uh, incentives to abstain from smoking. So that people are going to get one per person in month one, one per person in month three. And then we're going to randomize again the incentive amount in the week. And then there's going to be this month two intervention where we actually try to nudge people out of an addicted state, where we again try to offer people money for abstaining during that month two, and that's going to be every week for the treated group. And we're going to offer some, we're going to direct people to web-based support, and this is going to be a random 67% of the sample. So projection bias is going to pr primarily come from um, the uh, our estimate of projection bias is going to come from number three, this intervention, as well as what people's predictions and valuations are, whereas uh, present bias is going to come from these predictions and valuations as they compare to the actual their actual behavior. So how do we remotely verify smoking status? So we uh, ask people that to provide a positive saliva coating test. Um, to qualify for the study. So that's going to screen out a lot of non-smokers. It's going to select for people who can do the saliva test, and it's going to show people's uh, faces that we're going to compare against when they have to upload pictures later on. So we mailed people cotinine tests um, uh, after the baseline survey. We mailed them two tests, one to do right, uh, right for qualification, and another for dur during the rest of the experiment. And then they had to upload, for every time that they had to do a saliva test, they had to upload a series of three photos. So the first was going to be them swabbing their mouth um, with their face visible. The second was going to be of the actual um, cotinine test window. And the third was with a black blackened out window um, so that that would prevent uh, reuse of, of the, the test. So there was a three-step verification process that people had to undergo to verify smoking status remotely. So first, they, they did a, an online survey where they self-reported their, their abstinence over the past seven days. Next, they had to do um, a, a certain group of people uh, had to do a saliva test each week. And so that, that was anybody who was eligible for incentives, as well as a subset of others, had to do the saliva test. And then we actually did an in-person visit as sort of a second round of saliva testing to try to verify the first round of saliva testing. And that was really just to get people to really believe that these saliva tests are binding. And, and in, in the case that they were invited for a second round, the second round test had to match what their first round test was. And so th then we also had people do um, two, in the weekly survey, there were two weekly truth-telling lotteries that were going to try to incentivize accurate smoking reports. So the first was that people were eligible in the weekly survey for a $50, $50 if their self-report matched their saliva test. And in that case, that's trying to incentivize people to, act, to report accurately. Um, so basically, anybody who, um, uh, everybody was eligible for, for that test, regardless of whether you smoked or not. The second test, uh, the second uh, lottery was $100 if you reported abstinence subsequently verified. And so that meant that it's preferable to be and to report being abstinent because we didn't want people to just report being smokers um, just in order to be eligible for the lottery. In this case, it's actually people, individuals are best off when they actually accurately report their smoking status and they're best off to accurately report if they had abstained. Okay, so. Um, how do we measure these real world biases? So um, we're going to ask subjects how much they would pay for these future incentives to abstain. We're going to do it in a way that's going to incentivize accurate reports. We're subsequently going to offer these cash incentives for future abstinence. And it's going to be those cash incentives are going to be paid out only if there's um, they're, they're confirmed to, to have abstained. And then what we're going to do is we're going to compare these valuations in the first bullet to the real world smoking bullet, the, the sorry, the real world smoking behavior in the second bullet, and that's going to tell us something about whether people are over optimistic about how much they think they value the incentive 
on, and how much they predict they're going to abstain versus how much they actually abstain when they're offered money. Then projection bias is going to, um, again, nudge people out of um, an addicted state. And then we're going to compare people's um, valuations of their future, the future abstinence incentives between those people who are treated versus not treated, the treated versus control subjects, before versus after the intervention. So in other words, does the intervention change people's beliefs about the value of abstaining? And that's an indicator of projection bias. The valuations, let me just tell you quickly and then we'll pause for questions. So uh, each of the three sessions, we elicited these valuations of future absence incentives in a target week of month three. So there was a series of questions in each one. You can see in an example here. So we asked people to make a choice between the abstinence incentive in the future versus some unconditional incentive. So would you rather have $150 if you don't smoke during week nine? And we also had a calendar displayed that showed people when week nine was. So this was the abstinence incentive. Or would you rather have $60 regardless of whether you stop smoking during the same week? And so we can compare with this series of, of questions, we can identify an actual willingness to pay for these abstinence incentives. And then we can ask people about multiple um, abstinence incentive amounts in multiple weeks. And this is going to um, give us some nice variation within, in, within person. Um, we also elicited stated predictions of future abstinence. So for the same um, incentive amount, we got predicted probabilities of, do you think you would abstain for say $150 in week nine. Um, and so we also have, so those are unincentivized predictions. And in the, the study, I'm not gonna talk about it a lot, but we also compare those to the valuations. And in some cases, I'm gonna present the predictions today just because it's a little bit easier to understand. So the experimental design is, uh, we have these three elicitation uh, sessions for the valuations of the incentives. We offer incentives in week one, sorry, one week in, in month one, one week in month three, and then the intervention is going to occur in week in month two, uh, weekly uh, for the treated group. Okay, so let me pause here for questions. Uh, great. Is this where I jump in, Justin? Please do. Uh, yes. Okay, so uh, Justin and C, please just stop me. I have lots of questions, but I know that you haven't got to results yet. So um, stop me at any time. So Justin, thank you. For, this is a really thoughtful presentation. And um, uh, I think the paper is really interesting. I have some like duh questions, I think about how the actual experiment and the testing happens. So you showed the picture of this woman with the thing in her mouth, and then you, you have to submit three pictures. But how do I know that the actual t second picture is the same swab that is in her mouth in the first picture? Um, so we compared pictures across different, so, so, I mean, the, the, essentially we don't know for sure. So for example, if people took multiple pictures of the same, uh, uh, test, then we wouldn't be able to, to, uh, to, to really know for sure, but we did compare pictures across different, uh, saliva tests. And so if they uploaded the identical photo, we, we basically tossed it out. So um, we also did ask people to black it out to try to ensure that they wouldn't um, reuse a test. But, you know, if people sort of smudged it out and, you know, if they took a, with a lot of effort, that could be possible and people could, could have gamed the test. Um, we, for other reasons, we don't think that happened extensively, but it, it, um, it could have happened, you know, sort of uh, in small amounts. Great. I don't know enough about cotinine. Are e-cigarettes, would, would that be picked up in these swaps? Yeah, so um, both NR nicotine replacement therapy and e-cigarettes would have triggered a positive test. So something I, I should have mentioned but didn't is that uh, if people, um, we, we also asked people in the weekly survey, did you use NRT or did you use e-cigarettes? We told people at the start of the, the study that they were allowed to use these products. Um, if they reported using those products, they we, we gave them the incentive anyway. Um, we did also look about at, at whether people sort of like show evidence of learning that they could sort of game the the, um, the system in this way. And we don't find that people are like um, a, a big increase in that people are like increasing this over time or that a lot of people are, are reporting this more than they reported at baseline. So I think uh, I have a question about intensive margin as opposed to extensive margin. So like, what if your cotinine level went down? It's, I think it's related to the e-cigarette question, which is like, aren't there multiple ways that we can think of like good outcomes for health here? And the abstinence really focuses only on like this fairly extreme measure. Am I thinking about that right? Yeah, definitely. So in part, we're, you know, the, I think the issue about like um, 
getting people to exit an addicted state, I think we, we do care about smoking cessation explicitly there. Um, we could think about, you know, if people are reducing their, um, uh, you know, the number of cigarettes that they're smoking, that could provide health benefits, for example. Uh, we, it gets a little bit uh, trickier there and the test, the codeine test doesn't allow us, at least the one that we used, didn't all allow us to sort of detect those uh, changes. We could have relied on the self-reports, um, but for those reasons, we, we focus just on smoking cessation. What calendar time did you do this experiment? So it was 12 weeks. Um, the main focus is going to be on uh, the four weeks in month three. Sorry, what year was oh. it? Uh, so, right. So I, I think this happened in 2018. So this is actually quite old, again, as a casualty of the pandemic. I was just wondering if you could comment on like, were there major things? I mean, what was going on in the broader policy environment that may have interacted with any of these biases you might be concerned about? It's related to a question of like, you know, when I look at the distribution of cities, like there's quite different tax rates across those cities, et cetera, et cetera, which may have implications for their willingness to pay for certain types of things. Have you thought about exploiting that variation or at all? So, so in a lot of our, our models, we're gonna be using um, individual fixed effects that are gonna sort of like wipe away the, um, the influences of um, these sort of environmental factors. Um, so we're basically like looking at changes within the same person over time uh, in their behavior uh, it's also a short, a fairly short study period of three months, and so there's not. I, I think, to my knowledge, like during this time period, there what there weren't like major policy changes that were happening during our intervention period. It is something we can go back to to um, reassess, but but I think for those reasons, we don't think. I think it's interesting to to think about, and you could imagine sort of doing some interesting subgroup analyses, but we haven't done that so far. Um, and then uh, I'll stop and give you let you get to the results, and I'll have more questions later. Thanks. Thank you. See, should I keep going? Yeah, sh yeah, please. Okay, I'm, I'm way behind time, so I'll try to move uh, somewhat quickly here. Um, okay, so what are, I'm gonna talk about the reduced form analysis. Again, this is without overlaying our particular uh, structural model onto the data, just sort of like, what did the data show? And so there are three key hypotheses I'm gonna focus on here. So the first is, uh, um, in the treatment month, did it increase abstinence in the treated versus controls? And I've already argued that that's really important for measuring projection bias. The second thing that we wanna look at, at is, uh, are subjects over optimistic about their willingness to abstain in a future week relative to what we actually observe their abstinence to be? So basically, what's the difference between people's predictions versus their actual behavior? Third, um, do people, do subjects mispredict the effect that the cessation intervention, that month two intervention is going to have on their willingness to uh, subsequently stay abstinent? And for that, we're going to look at the double difference in predictions before versus after treatment for the treated and control group. And so basically, did the treatment change people's predictions about the value of abstaining? That's the idea. OK, so baseline characteristics. Uh, again, there's about 400 smokers. Um, we actually uh, we end up getting mostly uh, women. Uh, the, our age uh, uh, range is, is a little bit more compressed than the national. Uh, what, what you'll find in a national sample, 75% uh, we, were non-Hispanic white, 13% um, were non-Hispanic black. Um, it's, uh, um, slight, I think, somewhat more higher income sample. Uh, and, and I think that's consistent, but the age and the income are sort of consistent with the fact that this is an online sample and people had to have access to a smartphone. Um, mean cigarettes per day was about 15 at baseline. Uh, you know, 56% were um, nicotine dependent according to a Fagerstrom test, um, and about uh, a third were, were planning to quit within 30, uh, within the next six months. Um, E-cigarette use was, you know, fairly low. There were some dual users, and it was about 26% overall. In general, there was a good balance between the con uh, treated and control group uh, across these different characteristics, which is um, what we would want. Uh, of course, the, the treated and control is really just one of the randomizations that we care about, as we've talked about. Okay, so jumping into our results. So here I'm showing you the proportion that would abstain, that sorry, that do abstain uh, based on their predictions about uh, abstinence or their actual abstinence behavior by incentive level. So the um, so in other words, this is the incentive level uh, going from zero, you know, no, uh, no incentives up to four hundred dollars, and the green data series is their actual behavior. So for example, 10% of people actually abstained when there was no incentive, 
um, in you know slightly upward sloping versus people's predictions are these top three data series. And so you can see that the dark top line is at baseline. And then people subsequently um, uh, revise downwards their predicted probability of abstaining. And here I am showing you predictions instead of their actual valuations, just because it's a little bit um, more interpretable. But you can see, that, so, so this is also upward sloping. So people did believe that the incentives would have some impact on their willingness to abstain. Um, but they, they got a little bit more pessimistic um, after the baseline. This is the control group. This is the treated group. The treated group is quite similar. Um, however, in the treated group, you can also see that there's an even further downward revision in people's predictions that they became a little bit more pessimistic about their willingness to abstain in month two after the intervention versus month one. And that's actually going to be very important for identifying our projection bias is sort of this uh, difference between this light pink versus this uh, medium pink. Okay, looking at similar uh, data, control versus treated group, except looking over time instead of by incentive uh, level. So over time, you can also see that there was, um, or I think one key thing is there's this huge gap that occurs between uh, actual observed behavior, um, which you know ticks up over time a little bit, versus what people's predictions are. And this gap, I think, gets at people's over-optimism, which could be an indicator of present bias or uh, naivete, it's some combination of those two. And people continue to be very uh, over-optimistic, even in month three, after they've had experience with quit incentives in month one, um, you know, after they've gone through the, the intervention, they continue to have this um, major over-optimism. So, you know, at no point do they predict being uh, below, say, uh, 35%, whereas their abstinence never gets above 20%. And you can see that there is a slight increase in abstinence in the treated group versus the control group, uh, notably in month three. And you can also see that downward revision that we just saw in the other uh, figure here um, in the treated group. Okay, so now we're going to move to our regression analysis. Okay, so what's the effect of the, the that uh, month two intervention on abstinence? So what we do a difference in differences, treated versus control um, in month one versus month three is what 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 um, at least this uh, first column is showing, and this indicates that there's a 5.8 percentage point increase in abstinence as a result of the intervention. So that's good news. That sort of me that means that the intervention worked for at least some of our, um, uh, our per participants. And this implies that the treated group is relatively less addicted, at least a subset of them are gonna be less addicted following the treat treatment month relative to the control group. Um, so that, that's what we want. And then when we include month two data um, here uh, in the second column, the, the results are identical pretty much. Okay, so that, that's the first thing, the intervention sort of worked. The second is what's that gap, that over-optimism gap between people's actual um, behavior and what they predicted them, their, their uh, response to the incentives to be. So here we're gonna actually stack um, observed abstinence in, in the data on top of their predictions. And then we can make um, an indicator variable for whether their abstinence it refers to their behavior or to their predictions. And then we can re regress that on what their um, absence was, whether it's predicted or, or observed behavior. And what we find is that there's a 42.9 percentage point gap between what people, uh, people's actual absence was relative to what they predicted their absence to be. And so th this is th that uh, gap that we saw in the time series earlier. And this is ju just reinforces the fact that there is this severe over-optimism, over which is most likely due to naivete. In, in this sort of, in the, in the reduced form results, we can't say it's specific, like, you know, necessarily this is about naivete, but this is suggestive, suggestive support in favor of that. And then the structural model, we will actually like, uh, try to um, say definitively, this is what, what we interpret to be uh, naive pre present bias. And another thing that we can do is we can inter interact that um, indicator variable with the incentive amount. And we see that for larger incentives, people become more over-optimistic. So in other words, what this means is that if people get for an additional $100, people become five percentage points more over-optimistic. Their predictions are, are five percentage points more mispredicted for a large, so they mispredict um, even more at larger incentive amounts. Third thing we're gonna look at here is around the difference in differences in predictions. Um, so this is getting at, again, projection bias. 
Uh, and so what we find that there is this downward revision in, predict, in um, people's predicted abstinence before versus after treatment um, by 4.9 percentage points. And this is consistent with um, the idea that the treated group projected those cravings onto what they, their, what they viewed the value of quitting to be after the treatment. Okay, so that, that's the um, reduced reform results. Um, I'm now going to jump to the structural model very quickly. So just to give you a very quick flavor um, without going into depth here, basically we are going to try to estimate a number of different key parameters. So we're going to try to estimate what are the costs, the disutility of abstinence. We're going to try to estimate what are the discounted discounted long run benefits of abstinence, which is going to be um, uh, Delta uh, uh, B, where th this is actually the standard, um, we're going to assume that this is going to be equal to one that this um, standard discount factor that, that is used in economics. So um, anyway, the, the long term benefits, and then we're going to have this conversion factor from utils to dollars and that comes directly from um, uh, the incentives. So basically, like, how do people respond to the incentives. We're going to estimate uh, the treatment effect as well as what people predicted the incent the treatment effect to be, what they predicted it to be both beforehand um, and what they predicted it to be after the fact. And then we're going to estimate what people's present bias was and what their degree of naivete was. So you can see here, for example, how these combine in some sort of utility function for those who are more familiar with what this looks like, but basically the utility of abstinence it, um, for the treated group um, after the treatment month would be this uh, eta factor, which is the treatment effect, plus um, uh, beta delta B, um, so basically like plus this discounted benefit, um, plus what, whatever the incentive was, so the incentive itself delivers some benefit, you know, that, that dollar amount, plus this, um, th this conversion factor from utils to, to dollars, minus whatever the costs were, so sort of the benefits minus the costs, um, where the benefits are, are um, th these first three factors. And one key thing that um, just to note that we can decompose the valuations in our model into what the cash value is, plus people are going to value the actual commitment that these incentives provide for them. So in other words, if people value the idea that these incentives are going to help them to quit, then that commitment value of the, is gonna, of the incentives is going to be positive. Maybe people think that the, the, these incentives are a pain in the butt, and that could actually be negative, in which case this commitment value would be negative. But if people are present bias, this commitment value would be positive. They actually value the commitment. And we're, we can actually use this fact um, in separating present bias from naivete. Um, and so our actual estimates uh, are, are here. I'm just going to call out a, a couple of these. I'm going to show you some more data in a minute. The first thing is that um, the disutility and the, the long, so the, the cost of quitting versus the benefits are actually quite similar, both in utils and dollars. Um, our scale factor is really small. So just coming from people's responsiveness to the incentives is really small. People, even for like $400, there's a, a, a substantial fraction of a per subjects who do not quit. And that's going to affect when we convert utils to dollars. Um, the treatment effect is 0.56, whereas people think beforehand it's going to be 0.13 utils. After the fact, they actually think it's going to be, um, this is not significant, but they think it's mar they, that they're marginally worse off. Present bias is going to be, um, they are present biased and they are, uh, this is less than one, and they're um, na naive that their um, beta tilde is going to be less than one as well. So you can see here, this is just a figure that's showing beta, our present bias, relative to um, naivete, um, beta tilde. Everybody in our sample has beta less than one. That means that they're all present biased, and a substantial fraction of them um, have beta tilde um, greater than beta, which indicates that they are naive, um, but you know the, the beta tilde is 0.85, which is pretty close to one, so we, we interpret this as partial sophistication. Um, projection bias, we do, I already alluded to this fact that people um, basically underestimate the value of the treatment. Beforehand, they don't think it's going to be help them. After they, the fact, they think that they're actually worse off. Um, when we combine this with our welfare calculations, we find that um, correct, that just looking at beta B minus C, that people have a strong motivation to continue smoking, basically uh, abstaining without taking it from the, the perspective of being present biased. It's better off to keep smoking because the, those, that immediate discomfort outweighs um, the benefits. 
However, once we actually correct for the fact that people have present bias, we find that um, it becomes roughly welfare neutral um, to, uh, to continue smoking. And then when we correct for both present bias and the projection bias that people have that they don't uh, appreciate the, the benefits of, of quitting, we find that there is this huge, um, or, or what I would call a large um, private welfare loss of $400 per week. So this translates into about $80 per pack that, that individuals um, suffer a private welfare loss. And a lot of the, the bias is coming from present bias, that present bias is decreasing the value of quitting by $2,600. Projection bias is, is important, but it's a much less uh, uh, amount. And our welfare calculations imply that banning cigarettes altogether would actually be welfare enhancing by $350 per week. Okay, so wrapping up, I'm uh, running over, that basically we, we find that there is this um, pat pattern of biased beliefs and preferences that are not consistent with rational addiction. Um, under people, uh, people's own long-run preferences, what they report to us in this um, incentive-compatible way, people are uh, suffering a welfare loss. Um, a, sell, a sales ban, I said, can, can actually uh, in, be welfare enhancing. I think that final slide is that, you know, I think RIAs, the, the regulatory impact analyses, should really strive to incorporate these internalities. Policy interventions can also account for them. You know, for example, this might point towards increased use of pre-commitments um, or the fact that people don't appreciate the, the fact that the incentive that um, interventions help, you know, maybe escalating reward schedules can be important. And the fact that the addiction is so important to people's behavior, really focusing on smoking prevention. Um, so we also, you know, have some these nice experimental features around the lottery and um, the experimental variation. But um, why don't I, I stop there? Thanks, Justin. I think let's address probably one or two Q&A from the audience, uh, from Norbert Schmidt. And uh, he asked whether it was possible to do CO tests um, to verify smoking status in your experiment. Uh, can we do CO, CO tests? Yeah, CO tests. Yeah, absolutely. So the issue here, though, is that remote monitoring, like we would have to mail a CO monitor to every single person in the, the study, which is much more expensive um, than uh, the, the saliva test work. Yeah, and um, you also have some questions regarding the um, content smokers. I think a question that he has is that uh, there are smokers who know that they don't have much self-control, but don't care, and they never have any intention to quit. So do the best is that in your framework can capture this type of smokers? Yeah, so we, we did look at some heterogeneity based on people's, um, whether people were planning to quit. We do actually find that, you know, the I think that, um, uh, I think present bias was, was worse among people who, who wanted to quit, I think. Uh, and, and so you, th that can be an important factor. Um, what type of bias will I uh, face by both smokers and non-smokers while working in, um, this is from Gary Hall, I don't think it's a complete Q&A, sorry. So, um, so another Q&A from Norbert is that, um, there is uh, some. There may be some concerns about selection bias when you try to kind of estimate the content smokers and who are not content smokers. So even if the participants are not trying to quit, uh, isn't it likely that most participants were subconsciously interested when answering to this study in the first place? So would that be a concern? So we, we recruited people regardless of whether what their intention was of quitting because we wanted this to apply to a broad sample of smokers. Um, I, I think that that you know whether people wanted to quit or not that that could matter. But uh, in general, we ask people to you know do you think you're going to quit for a hundred dollars in in a future week? And you know regardless of whether they wanted to quit, they were making those predictions. If they didn't want to quit, then you know maybe they that would have been a, a lower prediction, and that would be incorporated into our estimates. Okay, so I guess one last question from the audience. Um, so Gary Hall sent in um, more questions to clarify. So, well, um, so what type of bias will I face by both smokers and non-smokers while working in a tobacco growing state like Kentucky? What type of bias will I face by both smokers? And uh, yeah, so uh, while working to promote clean air ordinances and smoking cessation programs. 
Yeah, so I think that, I mean, the, the policy environment that people um, operate in or general like environment, you know, social environment, I think, you know, if you're in a tobacco growing state, you know, maybe that would affect your uh, interest in quitting, you might see uh, have a more favorable view of um, the industry, for example. And so I think that could affect people's predictions and, you know, that that could lead to differences in how people um, uh, respond to our questions, although I'm not sure that would affect people's uh, biases ne necessarily. I, I think that the idea would be that these behavioral biases are sort of more uh, deeper, deeper psychological parameters that aren't going to necessarily be responsive um, to that in a causal way, at least. Thank you, Justin. I think we're about time. Uh, so, Kitty, if you have any additional comments and uh, questions, please send to Justin, and thank you very much. Uh, so, Hong Jin, please uh, take it over and wrap up the uh, seminar. Thanks very much. Thank you, Justin. Okay, we are out of time. Thank you to our presenter, moderator, and discussion. Finally, thank you to the audience of 140 people for your participation. Have a top-notch weekend.